Hey guys, welcome back. This is Automotive Weekly Waveform number nine. Last week we did the camshaft crankshaft correlation, um, building upon our VR sensor test and our Hall Effect sensor test. For this week, we are going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to jump into some ignition testing. Um, I know that we didn't fully analyze the camshaft crankshaft correlation um, and go into measuring the timing and all that in the past videos, but um, we did some of that in the live stream. So we're gonna move on to ignition systems. And I'm gonna start out with the basic ignition system or the classic ignition system a little bit here. Now we're not gonna go all the way back to points because um, I don't have a test vehicle that runs that's easy for me to access to, to jump into that. Um, so we're gonna go with a basic V8 truck with a distributor with a external coil or an external coil and we're gonna start out with just the primary test. We're not gonna go into the spark plug leads yet. Um, we're just gonna look at the ignition primary. So the difference between the ignition primary and the secondary is inside an ignition coil, there are two windings of wires. The primary side is the 12 volt system. Um, you have normally 12 volts coming in, a toggling ground on the other side. In that primary side, you know, as current starts to flow, it builds up a magnetic field. That magnetic field affects the secondary side as well. So the secondary side has a different number of windings and the windings vary, um, different ignition coils, depending on the performance, the design, you know, it's normally anywhere from 40 turns to one to 70 turns per one. So for every one coil of the primary side, we may have 70 turns on the other side um, or vice versa. I can't remember which one it is. But what we're gonna do essentially is we're going to, anything that's on the primary side, we're gonna amplify that voltage wise on the secondary. But our, our amp amperage is gonna go way down. Um, Ohm's law and we're gonna have some efficiency losses as well. But Looking at the primary side, some of that is going to mirror over to the secondary side. Um, but there are many different diagnostic things that we can see on both sides separately. So we're gonna start with the primary side because there are two different tests that we can do on the primary side on the conventional ignition system. And that is a primary voltage and primary current. And the reason I'm starting with the basic ignition system or conventional ignition system is because on the newer stuff, we can't check the primary voltage. Um, that is inaccessible to us because that is built into the ignition coil. There's additional electronics in there that block us from checking that. So we can apply this to some of that information once we get to the newer style coils. So there's a few things that we need to do to protect our scopes while we are testing the ignition system. Um, the ignition primary side, or the 12 volt side, it still has the potential of reaching 400 volts the secondary side has a potential of reaching 50,000 volts. So we do need to use some caution. Uh, 50,000 volts into our scope may be a bad thing. 400 volts into our scope may be a bad thing. If you are using the Snap-on lab scope connecting to the primary side of this vehicle, um, you shouldn't have an issue. The attenuators are built in on most of the Snap-on lab scopes. I think everyone that everyone's using in the group has them built in. The ATS scope has them built in. The Pico scope and the U scope, they do not have attenuators built in. Um, so for my Pico scope, I have a 20 to one attenuator. Um, I got mine with my kit. I think these are like a hand tech unit. Some attenuators are 10 to one, some are 20 to one, some are 40 to one. I believe the one on the U scope is a, like a 40 to one. The U scope can be damaged by voltages above 40 volts my particular Pico scope has a maximum input voltage of 100 volts. Um, so I could get away with testing some stuff, but if the spikes jump over that for too long, I could cause damage inside my scope. So always use an attenuator when scoping ignition coil on the primary side, um, fuel injectors, solenoids, anything that has a, uh, has a potential of kicking voltage back up normally anything that has a coil built in. So going back to how we're gonna test this, um, we are going to do kind of two tests in one today. I, I don't wanna string this out too much, but we're gonna have a voltage test and an amperage test. For the voltage test, we need the attenuator. We need one of our scope leads. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna connect the ground of the scope lead 
um, either to engine block ground or the battery ground, either one. And then the positive side of this lead is going to be connected to the control side of the ignition coil. Now, the control side of the ignition coil is normally um, going to the PCM or a power transistor of some sort that's gonna control that ignition coil. Now, if you connect to the other side of the coil, you'll see 12 volts, but you won't see all the detail we need to see. Um, if we're on the control side, which is 90% of the time the negative side of the coil, then we're gonna see a lot of information um, and it's gonna be very valuable information. And then our second channel for now, we are going to look at the amperage on the primary side. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our amp clamp, we're gonna hook this around either one of the wires, whichever one's easy to get to, because if we remember back when we were talking about current um, in earlier videos, the current is the same at any point in a series circuit. So I don't care if it's coming into the coil or leaving the coil, we're gonna get the same waveform. Now, unfortunately, if we go near the coil with this, we are gonna get some extra noise, but it shouldn't be too bad. Um, I know I can get this around the lead going to the coil, so that's probably what I'll do, and I'll just have to maybe filter out some noise. So I'm gonna get these things connected, and then we'll get some waveforms, and we will talk about the waveforms. So on this V8 Dodge, um, Howard, if you're watching this, yours will be very similar to this. Um, ignition coils mounted up front. We have two wires coming in. Now, I don't know which one is the control and which one's the power supply. Um, if I back probe the wrong one or pierce the wrong one, I'll just switch to the other one. This, I'm just on there. I don't know if I got the direction right or not, but since we're using um, the lab scope, we can always invert the waveform. Plus, I have enough room that it's real easy just for me to flip over the amp clamp if I'm on the wrong wire or if I have the current going in the wrong direction. Remember, use an attenuator. We have an attenuator hooked up at the Pico scope for this channel. For our settings, we need to let the scope know that we're using an attenuator. So for probe, I'm gonna go to times 20 because that attenuator is gonna shrink my waveform um, by a magnitude of 20. So I need to blow it back up in the software here. Um, Oops. We're not gonna turn on filtering. We're not gonna turn on any scaling. Um, what we wanna do for our, okay, I'm gonna make a custom probe for this real quick. I forgot that I wasn't using the Auto Nerds version of the software um, because now that I'm on the 20 to one scaling, the, the factory default, I wanna be able to go to at least 200 volts, but I don't need to go to negative 200 volts. I really just need to go to like, you know, negative 20 um, and I should be fine just in case I have some negative spikes going down that low. So I'm gonna go to tools, custom probes. I'm gonna go up here to the 20 to one and duplicate it. And then we are going to edit this. And I'm gonna leave everything the same, but I want to manage my own ranges. So new range of negative 20 to 200, apply, okay. It says that I'm not using the full range of the input, that's fine. I want another new range and we are gonna do negative 20 to 400, apply and hit okay. Um, those two ranges are probably all I'm gonna need um, for this particular case, I suppose I can add one in there for 100 volts um, just because we're in here making them. If you have the Auto Nerds version of the software, these are preloaded in there and, and there's more options as well. Um, you really don't even need to click the factory 20 to one option. I'm gonna hit next, okay, finish that, close that. And now we're gonna select the new 20 to one down here, and we're gonna pick negative 20 to 200 volts. So that is going to be our ignition voltage primary control. The second channel, I'm using a snap-on low amp clamp. I'm not exactly sure what the scaling is, if it's the same as the PicoScope, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. We'll pick the 20 amp clamp mode. Um, and I don't expect to see more than 10 amps um, 
but I haven't scoped one of these in a while, at least on the current side of it. Um, but we'll leave it there for now. And then time base on the screen, we'll start with the PicoScope around 20 milliseconds per division. Let's go ahead and start up the vehicle. Okay, so we can see that my amp clamp is backwards, but my ignition primary, I am on the control side. We see that information. But we're going off the screen here, so I'm gonna bump this over to our other scale that goes up to 400. We're still bumping off the screen, um, but we should be all right. We don't really need that fine detail on that little bit. Okay, I hooked the amp clamp to the other lead. And on the Pico scope, I wanna make sure that this is an eight cylinder engine. I wanna make sure that I have at least eight cylinders on the screen. Um, honestly, since we can zoom in afterwards, we could change our time base up a little bit more and, and have more information there. Um, in case we have an intermittent misfire, sometimes you'll want to get more cylinders on each screen so you can see the differences between those. I'm gonna go ahead and stop our capture. I'm gonna shut the vehicle off and we'll talk about this. Okay, so now that we have a waveform gathered up, let's zoom in on this information and take a look. So I'm gonna zoom in. I'm gonna grab the zoom tool here. And I like to zoom from the bottom of the screen. Now, I don't think this works on PicoScope 7, um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna zoom in. Um, I'm gonna get a couple of cylinders. Now, since this has one ignition coil, we're, our amperage is gonna be the same more than likely for every single firing event. We're not comparing multiple ignition coils. Um, so we're not looking for the odd man out necessarily on the amperage waveform. Where we will see a difference is in the voltage side, the primary voltage. Um, we will see some differences based on the energy leaving the coil going into the spark plug. Um, so now that I'm here, I'm gonna zoom into a single cylinder. And I wanna get the amperage and the ignition primary voltage on the same trace. So if you are working on a vehicle that doesn't have a distributor, um, for this exercise, we were, are working on um, dumb ignition coils or ignition con coils that don't have their own power transistor built in. So a two wire ignition coil. So if you're working on another vehicle that has the dumb ignition coils, um, Toyotas are kind of common up until around 0304. Um, so anything older than that, they typically have a dumb coil. Um, we're looking for two wire coils. The Chrysler vehicles, that's pretty, pretty common. Um, up until the newer stuff, like any of the Intrepids with that 3.3 liter engine, the 3.5, 27 should have two wire coils. Um, so th those are just some examples of the two wire ignition coils where you guys can do this. Now, if you guys are working on the Subarus, I know we got a lot of Subaru guys that are common vehicle that comes in the shop, that's gonna have a waste fire coil pack. So you're gonna have one power wire coming in typically, and then two control wires. Same thing with a Chrysler PT Cruiser. One power wire coming in, two control wires. So you could put your, your amp clamp around the power wire coming in, put your primary voltage one on one of the single control wires, and then you'll see the amperage for both coils and you'll see control for one coil. Okay, so now that we have this waveform on the screen, we have an amperage waveform. We have the ignition primary control voltage. Let's go to the beginning of the waveform and see what information we can see, because we can see quite a bit. Now. I'm gonna zoom in first on the whole thing and then I'm gonna zoom in vertically on the voltage side. And I'm gonna drop a measurement down right here. This measurement is my battery voltage. We have 14.6 volts. The reason that it's at 14.6 on the control side of the coil is we don't have anything, we don't have any current flowing. Um, if we went back up and looked at our current right here, we don't have any current flowing through that. We have power going to it but the control side isn't activated yet. Um, this tells me that I have power to the coil and that my coil isn't a complete open circuit. I have voltage potential going through the coil to the other side of the coil and I'm taking that measurement right here. Now we can't verify that we don't have voltage drop somewhere in the waveform um, because there's no current flowing. We have to have current flowing to measure our voltage drop. If we drop another cursor down right here, 
We can see that when our waveform drops down, we drop down to half a volt, um, pretty close to zero um, in, in the, the scope of things. Let's go back and zoom out a little bit. If we look at our waveform here, let me put a vertical cursor right here. We'll drop down a current measurement. Um, for one, this is gonna tell us if our amp clamp was zeroed properly, because I did flip it around and I didn't hit the zero button. So I'm just gonna put zero on the measurement. We can see that we're off a tiny bit, that's okay. Let me zoom in here. Um, I know the blue is hard to see. I can blow that up a little bit. Okay, so on our blue trace, channel A, which is our voltage trace, we're sitting at battery voltage. We have no current flowing. We can see, because I have the measurement on there at zero, no current is flowing. The computer says, hey, we need to charge up this ignition coil. Because um, here in a few milliseconds, we need a, we need a spark. So we're gonna start charging up this ignition coil. Let's turn it to ground. We have power at one side of the ignition primary side. The computer is sucking this side to ground. Current starts to flow through this wave or through this ignition coil. We can see that in the waveform because we see this, this little hump right here. Now we get some oscillations that happen at the beginning and at the end of our current waveform. And that's normal, we wanna see that. Um, there's several reasons for this. For one, anytime you have a coil of wire, um, they call it an, an inducer, and it kind of restricts the, the flow of current a little bit. And then as the magnetic field changes slightly, as current is going into there, that magnetic field flexes a little bit. Um, it kind of gives a little pushback on the voltage, and then it says, okay, I'll come in, and then it pushes back, and, and it has a little tug of war action going on. We normally see you know, four to six oscillations at the beginning of an ignition coil. If you have a vehicle with multiple coils, this is a good thing to look at. You wanna compare the oscillations between your ignition coils, because if all of your coils have oscillations but one, that could be an indication that that one coil is degrading internally. Um, let me zoom out a little bit. I know I'm given a lot of information. This is, this is a very deep subject and a lot of information in the subject. And I know we weren't talking about analyzing waveforms, but I think some of this information is critical for capturing the waveform as well to know what we're looking at. Um, there are guys that truly excel at explaining this stuff and know it way more in depth than I do. Uh, I know the basics of it. I have enough knowledge with this to, to fumble my way through it if I have a misfire diag on the ignition system. But I can't tell you the whys and the hows of all of it. So we get one oscillation, two oscillations, three oscillations, four oscillations, five, and a little bit of six and a partial seven. And then it kind of smooths out and we don't really see the oscillations. Let me zoom out again. We can see that we are still down here on the blue line. Our coil is still held to ground. We see the current building, building, building. Since it's an inducer, it's still holding back a little bit and it slowly lets more and more and more in. So we see the current going, going, going. And then right over here at the end, now looking at this waveform, this, this coil, let me go back. I, I hit the zoom too soon. Um, this is a pretty typical ignition coil amperage waveform. We have oscillations at the beginning. We have a nice gradual rise. It almost looks linear. Now what we don't wanna see in this waveform is an ignition coil that at this point um, either no oscillations, we want to see the oscillations, or a waveform that this ignition coil has a really, really, really steep rise and then kind of flattens out at the top. We want it to be a gradual rise the entire time that the computer is holding it to ground. So the computer is holding it to ground here. We have a nice gradual rise over the entire distance of that. And then the computer lets go of that ground. It says, okay, we're turned on, we're turned on, and now it's time to fire it, we're gonna let go. A couple of things happen when we let go. Um, that magnetic field that we were building this entire time starts to collapse. And as it collapses, we have a lot of things happening. Um, for one, the voltage jumps way up, um, and we see that on the primary side. But as it collapses, it's collapsing also on the secondary side where we have 
way more windings. Um, and it acts like a transformer for your, for your, uh, your power lines. Um, so we're gonna, it's gonna boost that voltage up and we're gonna get a mirror image of this pattern, almost a mirror image of this pattern on the secondary side, but the magnetic field's gonna collapse on both of them at the same time. But we're gonna have like 15,000 volts on the other side. So let's zoom in to where that ignition coil turned off. We have quite a bit of noise happening. Um, I, I turned up my scaling on the blue trace. I'm actually just gonna turn the blue trace off for a second here so we can look at our amperage. Um, so my first couple of oscillations are bigger than what I can see on the screen here. Um, we exceeded the value, the maximum of our channel. Um, sometimes you see that, sometimes you don't. Sometimes it doesn't spike up and cause issues. It could be because I'm scoping both um, the primary side and I was going over my limit and this at the same time. So sometimes you can bleed through on the channels depending on what you're scoping. But we see some oscillations here. And then if I zoom in after that big spike of noise happens, see how we have the oscillations as it dies down? The computer says, okay, we're turning you off. The voltage is spiking up, the magnetic field is collapsing and the current is going back and forth, back and forth. Do we have a zero line? So that is our zero line. You see how we are going above and below the zero line? Well, that, that voltage has nowhere to go. It goes this way, and then it comes back this way, and it goes this way. So we're gonna see positive and negative um, on this typically. Typically, it'll always be above and below zero, just slightly, and we'll have multiple oscillations. Now, I can't give you the, the count of the oscillations on the leading or the trailing edge here. Um, I typically see five to seven oscillations on the turn on and turn off. Um, some vehicles, it, it'll be common to have three of them, but most, most vehicles, you'll see five to seven. Let's turn back our voltage channel, and I'm gonna zoom out. Now I scaled this up earlier just so we could see everything. I'm gonna bring it back down to zero scaling. We're gonna drop this back down to zero. And we're gonna zoom back into that waveform. So now that we kind of looked at the amperage, let's focus on the spark event itself. So I'm gonna zoom in after our amperage stops, uh, we still have activity on our voltage waveform. So at this point here, the computer said, okay, we're gonna turn off the coil. We had this big, big spike. Um, they call that an inductive kick. You'll get this on, on injectors, solenoids. Um, it may not be this traumatic, but that is the inductive kick. That is when that magnetic field collapses and we build all that additional voltage. So it is gonna go really, really high. I am set at 400 volts is what I set up this preset to. And it's not enough. And we get some oscillations at the beginning of that too. So when our coil is oscillating, our ignition voltage is also going to oscillate. We're gonna get some, some oscillations happening here. Now, when you're zoomed in this far, you can't, you can't get the whole picture. I'm gonna turn off the amperage waveform just to get it out of our way. We're gonna look at the voltage waveform. So this is a pretty typical example of a voltage waveform of what you'll see in reference books and, and other places of known goods because it gives us all the information that happened for that ignition waveform. So this is basically the timeline of the voltage. We're sitting here at battery voltage. The computer said, hey, let's turn on the, on the ignition coil. It turns off the ignition coil. We get that big spike, it jumps up. This big inductive kick is when the spark happens, how much energy is released and how much it takes to, to get that spark to jump the gap over on our spark plug. And then it drops down. Once it has the spark arcing across there, it takes less energy or less voltage to keep that going. So right here, the computer fired the coil, turned it off. We have our big spike, we're zoomed in a little bit. Once our big spike happens, that's how much voltage it takes to get that spark to go through the wire, um, jump the rotor gap, jump the spark gap. And then now that it's jumped all that stuff, here's what our voltage is for the, the spark plug. How much does it take to keep that spark plug going? So this is where, where that starts to happen. We see a little bit of a dip here and that's pretty common. Um, we have 
a combustion cycle happening. Pressures are changing a little bit. The ignition coil is losing a little bit of energy. And then we have this little hump here at the end. Now this is a pretty normal waveform for me. Now I don't analyze these every day, but this hump down here, that's where our combustion ended. That's where we, we ran out of stuff to burn. We ran out of energy in the coil. So we see this, this hump coming up here. Um, we see some oscillations happen as that, as that coil runs out of energy and that magnetic field has fully collapsed. That looks fairly normal. Now I did notice that some of these waveforms looked a little bit different between cylinders. So I'm gonna zoom all the way back out. We'll zoom in on just you know a few cylinders and we can see some slight differences here. Um, here's one that's quite a bit different, I think. So here's one that didn't dip. Um, it's a little more flat and then it rises at the end, but we don't have the, you know, it's not quite the dome. Um, this cylinder could be running a little bit different. We have some weird spikes right here. That could be some turbulence. That could be some pre-ignition. Maybe this cylinder is, you know, burning a little bit of oil. Um, like I said, I don't analyze ignition waveforms all the time. So I'm not a hundred percent familiar with every little difference between them. Um, once we get to the secondary side, I will share some insight with you guys on, on some of that stuff, um, stuff that I have learned from other people in the community. But for our basic waveform, um, I think this will be pretty much all we need. So I'm gonna add my amperage channel back in and I could probably scale that down just a bit. So it's not taking up quite as much room on the screen. And then I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more and we are gonna look at this. This is what I want for our weekly waveform submission. Um, if you wanna do one that shows all the cylinders as well, that is great. Um, but ultimately if you're taking one coil, you're just gonna have one event. So we want to see amperage for that cylinder. We want to see voltage primary control for that same cylinder or that same coil. We want the complete cycle. So over here, we have nothing happening. Um, and I guess I didn't even talk about dwell. If you guys are looking at older vehicles and notice that they talk about dwell time, dwell time is the amount of time that the computer is activating the coil. It's not the spark time or the burn time or anything like that. It is just the amount of time that the coil is activated. Older vehicles, it's done by the points and you have to adjust it. That's why that number is so critical in the older ones. But if we throw some measurements up on here, anytime that we have amperage going up um, on our waveform is a dwell time or anytime our control is pulled down to ground is our dwell. And on this particular one, we were at five milliseconds, almost exactly for our dwell time. Some vehicles you will see a fluctuation of dwell depending on the temperature of the engine, um, what RPM we're at, and, and a few other factors, um, battery voltage as well. Some vehicles you will see the same amount of dwell all the time irregardless. Um, point systems, typically the dwell does not change. If you see it fluctuating higher on some cylinders than the other cylinders, then either the distributor shaft is bent or the bushings are worn out and it's kind of moving around. Um, if the vehicle has a, a dumb igniter or a, I don't say it's smart and dumb a lot, but some vehicles, they call it a dumb igniter where it just, it keeps the same dwell all the time, no matter what. Some of them are temperature and voltage compensating. So this section of the waveform is called the dwell. We have our firing line right here or the spark line. And then right here we have the spark KV point or when the spark actually happens. This flat section right here, if we were to measure that, that is going to be our burn time. That's how long the spark plug actually has a spark going across it. And on this one, it's 1.5 milliseconds. We will have oscillations when the spark plug runs out of energy. After our burn time, we should have oscillations. We should have oscillations on the amperage waveform when it gets turned on and when it gets turned off. If you are doing a older vehicle with points, um, you may see a little bit of a difference in the waveform right here. You may see a little bump in there and that's where we 
have fully saturated the coil and we maxed out how much current can go in there. Um, so those waveforms do look a little bit different. So I think that's it. I hope you guys found this video helpful, at least in getting some captures of primary ignition waveforms. Like I said, I don't know all of the details and the breakdown of each individual waveform, although I will cover a little bit more when we jump into the secondary side of this waveform. Um, but for the primary side, we have the current and we have the control. If we have an issue with the control, we're not seeing what we want to see. At that point, we may want to check our power supply, make sure we don't have voltage drop on the power supply. Um, so this works with the two wire coils, the dumb ignition coils that the power transistor or the whatever transistor is turning on and off is built into an igniter somewhere else or built into the ECU. Um, so get some waveforms, post them up in the group. I'll put a link to the group down below if you want to participate in that. And then we will follow up with this stuff um, on Saturday in a live stream. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.